Can I just... Uh, All right. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I just want to say... Um, uh, before Maria starts, that Maria has been so helpful to me uh, in trying in getting this book done. She's introduced me to a number of the authors. She introduced us to Howard White. So it's, it's we're being published by Douglas and McIntyre because uh, Maria uh, put us in contact with them, and, and she's been extremely helpful advising me uh, all the way along. So thank you, Maria, and please go ahead. I'm very good at being bossy. <laughs> and James is wonderfully patient. So um, here we are. Uh, I find this very moving that we're coming to the end of uh, where James and I first came in 2011. And we've got the book wrapped up. And uh, it, it, is, it is sort of the end of an era for me. And, uh, of course, it's going to continue um, on, a, on another track, which is, which is excellent. But um, I've enjoyed all the papers, and of course, Betty and Jeffrey's hospitality as usual. And I feel we've had more than our share over the years. So thank you, both of you. Well, I'm not going to read my essay, which is going to appear in the, in the forthcoming publication, because I assume that most of you will have already read it, of course, because it's been available. Uh, similarly, I'm not going to build my marks solely around... Uh, Jeffrey's sculpture, because others have done that admirably. Nor am I going to show you some nice photographs. What I shall do is expand upon the notion which was explored in my essay, that Canada's culture, Canada's cultural history, the, all the, when I say culture, I'm referring specifically to the arts, um, has throughout its history, leaned on what, what one early 20th century commentator called foreign walking sticks. And, of course, this claim is relevant to what we're doing here, what we're doing in the book, because most of the essays show us the extent to which Jeffrey's work has indeed leaned on foreign walking sticks, and, and gone, we, we all know and we all admit, gone far beyond that. For example, in his uh, essay in the book, uh, which he wrote in 2000 and, uh, 2013, Ed Mazuris made that first connection between uh, Yves Klein and Rubinoff. And of course, James has uh, expanded upon that in his papers. And others have talked, Joan talked about the def debt that uh, Jeffrey owns, owes to uh, Jeffrey Smith. Um, we've also talked about uh, in encountering Tony Smith uh, at the University of Oklahoma. Indeed, all of Jeffrey's education, post-high post school education, uh, was taken in the United States. Uh, viewing as a as student um, the paintings of Rivera and Rodin when he was, the sculptures of Rodin when he, he was an undergraduate. And we could go on and on and on to show from Jeffrey's middle career how the United States in particular, played a role, and also visits, visits to uh, Rome and Italy in general. Now, in laying claims to the external influences, I'm not ignoring, and I, I will in this paper, but we can't ignore the impact that Canada's vast geography, vast and varied geography, um, its history, along with its religious and ethnic diversity has played on the formation of Canada's culture. And nor am I going to obviously claim that Jeffrey's circumstances are unique. And I could apply the template that I'm going to talk about to virtually every Canadian artist and sculpture. Certainly long before Canada was founded in 1867. Now Canada's first sculptors were foreign. 18,000 years ago, during the Holocene Age, the Duca people walked across the land bridge, which was then connected, uh, to, from present-day Siberia to the Yukon in northern Canada. And we know that the Duca people inhabited this region because they left chipped, scraped, chiseled animal bones, mostly horses, uh, a very small horse, which is now extinct, in the blue fish caves in the Yukon. I hope to go up there. 
at some point. And I like to make the claim that these were the country's first sculptors. Though I consider them to be really among the second wave. And who were among the second wave? Well, we all know that the um, First Nations people and Inuit people came about 4,000 to 6,000 BC, long after the Duke of People. Well, the sort of things that these early residents in Canada produced have been called by anthropologists and art historians. They say they're artifacts or curios. Indeed, for most art historians, the history of sculpture in Canada and the extent to which it was shaped from the outside really begins in 1534. And that was the year that John Cabot arrived in present-day Quebec and erected a 30-foot cross at the uh, Gaspé Peninsula. Peninsula. So are we to assume that this uh, 30-foot high cross is the first sculpture in Canada, according to uh, uh, most art historians? By the 16th century, liturgical carvings had become more sophisticated than this rather crude cross. Indeed, French artists were brought to New France to carve altar screens, to carve tabernacles, uh, to carve religious statues for the churches, convents, and seminaries in Quebec City and later in Montreal. And of course, they were all working successively in the Baroque, Rococo, and neoclassical style, styles. And their carvings were really of a very high standard, though they're considered colonial uh, by uh, French, uh, French scholars. And really, by the eight, early 18th century, French and Quebec-born sculptors began to incorporate indigenous themes into their work. The flora and fauna of Quebec, the landscape of Quebec, and even elements from First Nations clothing. And it's, it's amazing. I've seen several uh, Madonnas wearing moccasins. Uh, so this is, this is something that will emerge in the interwar years in the 20th century, the, the idea of incorporating um, local uh, subject matter with um, s styles that have been introduced from abroad. Well, following Great Britain's conquest of New France in 1763, secular sculptures replaced the religious ones, and of course they were commemorating Brid British royalty British statesmen, British military figures. And most of these sculptures at this point were actually brought, they were made in uh, Great Britain and brought to Canada. Indeed, in 1809, um, this, this company based in London uh, uh, constructed a Nelson's Column, which... Uh, was erected in Montreal in the Place uh, Jacques Cartier. And it was 40 years later that London got a similar, uh, almost exactly the same column in Trafalgar Square. By the time Canada was founded, as I said earlier, in 1867, British sculptors, along with the first generation of Canadian-born sculptors, began to commemorate Canada's political and military leaders and her captains of industry. But just like the French-Canadian liturgical sculptors, who continued to work, of course, they worked within the cultural traditions of the old world, what you know, we can generally call the old world. In fact, from 1867 to the outbreak of the Second World War, sculptors and people working in other areas of cultural activity were prompted to work within, particularly British cultural traditions, by Canada's governor generals. You may think, oh, well, you know, I mean, they were the representatives of the crown. Well, they did several things. Uh, in fact, I think, and I show in my, my book on the cultural history of Canada, how they, they, they formed the infrastructure of culture in this country. And uh, they believed that this would be a way uh, to unify the country's ethnically diverse and geographically dispersed peoples, which by 1867, we were getting people, not just British and uh, 
French uh, residents, uh, people were coming from the Ukraine and from various other parts of the world. Governor generals also believed that Canada was crude and that we lack culture. And also, I think they're a bit nostalgic because they wanted to recreate the kind of cultural environment that they left behind them in Great Britain. And they did this in several ways. From really about 18, uh, 1867 to the outbreak of the Second World War, they organized literary and drama festivals. They established prizes for writers, the Governor General's, Governor General's Literary Award. Need I say any more? They founded art academies and art societies modeled after British institutions such as the Royal Academy. They brought exhibitions of British art into Canada. And they ensured that Canada's National Gallery, which was founded in um, 1910, um, acquired British paintings and British sculptures for its permanent collection. And really their efforts paid off. The first director of the National Gallery of Canada came from Nottingham, British educated, British born. The country's English-speaking sculptors, sculptors studied at London's Westminster School of Art or the Royal Academy schools. And if they couldn't afford to go abroad to study, it was likely that their teachers would have been British-born and British-educated. They read art magazines like the Studio International, and some of them were even lucky enough to get their work published there. They attended lectures by visiting British art critics that the Governor General's brought in, and Eric Newton, well-known um, art critic of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, came, gave a series of lectures, and his line, if you read his diaries, he says, Canada is simply too big a country to carry on without outside stimulus. <laughs> Canada's artists likewise sought to have their work displayed at the Royal Academy's annual shows at Burlington House in London. And because their work, and this was, of course, one way of getting their work accepted at home, by having it first um, accepted in the UK. Now, following the Great War, Canada's artists and sculptors were like New France's liturgical artists before them, incorporating Canadian themes into their work. The landscape, the habitant, the French-Canadian habitant, and elements from First Nations culture. And they were doing this in an effort to produce an indigenous art form. Yet Canadian sculptors still considered Great Britain as home and still looked to Europe and particularly to, the, to Great Britain for artistic styles and standards, even though uh, they might have been incorporating these themes into their work. And in this sense, they could be called Canadian nationalists because they felt they were Canadian nationalists, but at the same time, they had a strong cultural allegiance to Great Britain. And I think if you were to look, and I've done a bit of this at cultural developments in New Zealand and Australia, this exactly the same thing happens. And this all is, this shows that, that Great Britain's influence was indeed more cultural than political in most of the Commonwealth countries, something that you know, one should, could really work on. And uh, one can see this in war memorials in um, all of the Commonwealth countries. The um, artist will pick a, a Canadian or Australian or New Zealand um, uh, uh, infantryman and at the bottom, it says, he died for the empire. So you have these two sensibilities going on. Well, following the Second World War, things changed. Europe, Britain were in ruins. The war memorial frenzy that occurred after the First World War did not happen after the Second World War. Sculptors were beginning to create work to relieve the aesthetic puritanism of purely functional design of our buildings. Um, and this gave them, of course, lots of work, lots of employment. Um, so during the building boom um, following the Second World War, we had lots of new universities. We had airport terminals um, that were springing up really all over the country. And this provided a lot of work. So sculptors were shifting 
their interest from the pure monument memorial to something else. But something else was also significant after the war. In the minds of many, despite its late entry into the Second World War, America, or the United States, had won the war. And this meant that in Canada, America was to determine the future in political and cultural terms. And of course, this had an enormous impact on Canada. During the 1940s and 50s, sculptors and painters studied in the US, particularly in New York. They participated in American exhibitions. They sought to have their work illustrated in American publications. They brought art critics like Clement Greenberg to Canada in order to give them what they called crits. And they brought artists and sculptors, of course, to places like the Emma Lake School in Saskatchewan. During the founding of Canada's new universities, most of the jobs were given to American teachers. While some Americans came north from the early 1950s, a number of Canadian sculptors went south. Some made the pilgrimage to David Smith's Sculpture Park at Bolton Landing. Others set up studios in New York. Some, like Ronald Bladen and Bob Murray, who I mentioned yesterday, took up permanent residence in the US and made big <clears throat> careers there. Artists in Quebec continued to be oriented towards France. They founded art journals that introduced French-speaking Quebecers to French culture and modernist culture. They accepted scholarships offered by the French government to study in France. They showed their work in Paris-based exhibitions. And some even set up their ateliers in Paris from where they produced sculpture for the Canadian market. But unlike the English Canadians, the Quebecers were fiercely independent and they, as they do today, felt that they were definitely Quebec artists, even though they were taking ideas from France. But even Quebec's artists, and I'm thinking particularly of the automatists, people like Bordois, ended up in New York, had ateliers in New York before settling in Paris. So this was the, the draw of the United States. Now, the federal government of Canada did not like this. Um, its first Canadian-born Governor General, Vincent Massey, uh, took over. Um, after the war, and he set up something called the Canada Council, and it was modeled after the British Arts Council. And the whole point was to promote a culture that was distinctly Canadian and not American. Now, in practice, it worked out differently. From 1957, the Canada Council funded art schools, and the Americans got the jobs. The Canada Council funded traveling exhibitions in the hope that the artists and sculptures would go to Europe. They went to New York. And when the Canada Council also founded regional art galleries, the majority of the directors were American. Likewise, when the Council offered traveling scholarships, where did they go? You know. Now, I'm not suggesting that English Canadian sculptors ceased traveling to London, being interested in the work of Moore and then Anthony Caro, or that French sculptors ceased traveling to Paris. I'm only saying that following the Second World War, despite the efforts of the County Council, or maybe because of the efforts of the County Council, the infrastructure of Canada's culture shifted. It became increasingly American. The fact is that by the 1960s, most Canadian sculptors really didn't see their work as British, American, French, or even Canadian. The Toronto sculptor, Gerald Gladstone, was asked in the early 1960s, what is your work? He said, well, Canadian sculpture as an individual statement doesn't exist. Montreal's Armand Valancourt echoed Gladstone's views when he claimed, well, Sculpture could only be called Canadian insofar as it was executed here. Now, the extent to which Canada's sculptures, sculptors had the right to see themselves as internationalists really became evident for most Canadians in 1967 when, during Canada's 100th birthday, 
we hosted an international exposition known as Expo 67. 51 Canadian sculptors installed their work on the, uh, on, Montreal's, uh, on the islands outside of Montreal. And they shared no style that could be specifically identified as Canadian, British, or American. They used diverse materials and methods, all of which made their work little different from the work of the other foreign sculptors who displayed their work around them. Indeed, virtually the only sculptors who were viewed as Canadian by the public and by the critics were the Inuit and First Nations, whose work was there in really two, two galleries, two spaces. But I should point out here that the Inuit and the First Nations artists themselves did not consider themselves Canadian. They related to their, their uh, tribal group, they related to their specific uh, landscape. They didn't see themselves as Canadians, even though everyone else did. And I should add that though the public liked their work, it was because they believed, they liked it because they believed that it was untainted by Western values and difficult to comprehend modernist sculptures. And of course, we all know that this was a very simplistic view of their work. The art of First Nations people living on the West Coast, Northwest Coast, had radically changed following contact with Europeans in the 1770s. The stone sculptures of the Inuit had been similarly influenced after contact with European whalers in the 18th century. Moreover, following the Second World War, the government set up programs to encourage the Inuit to uh, produce what I've called in, in my book on Inuit art, art made for strangers. In fact, they hi in 1949, they hired an artist who had uh, been very influ influenced by Henry Moore's work um, and uh, to create this little booklet, uh, a template for Inuit sculptures. And, you know, he created a pedestal uh, of course, Inuit sculpture never had pedestals. He made them larger, and Inuit sculptures were tiny. I mean, they're nomads. They don't carry around rocks. Um, and the forms, the animal forms, are very much like Moore. And if you've ever wondered why Inuit sculpture looks like a Henry Moore carving, there's your answer. So to return to where I began, I won't say that it has always been impossible for the country's artists, writers, dramatists, sculptors, dancers, to produce something what, that, that's really distinctively Canadian. I mean, after all, we created Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> but the foreign walking sticks have often been indispensable, an indispensable aid to generations of notable Canadian artists, including Jeffrey Rubinoff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Does anyone want to kick us off with some questions, comments? Mark. I, I just had a quick question in very architectural context, because I know uh, you worked on Arthur Erickson. Um, yeah. And, I mean, I don't know enough at all about Canadian architecture, but the, the little I do know, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the sort of absence of sort of strong Canadian architects and the absence of direct British influences. I mean, there's obviously sort of latent mm. initial immigrant visions, you know, things like the barn here, even, you can see oh. that. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a yeah, little bit sure about I that. Can. And also, yeah, well, even in the context of Expo 67, which, you know, yes. the famous Buckminster Fuller That's Dome, right. the That's great right. American. That's right. Know. That's right. Yes, and it dominated. Well, Erickson, in fact, um, was more influenced uh, by Japanese architecture than anything else. Um, the chains that come, to, I mean, you know, you look at an, an Erickson house, um, and indeed we had... Peter and I had something designed by Erickson and Massey, a writing studio. And, uh, you know, it's more Japanese than anything else. So Japanese, early in his career, he um, lived in um, um, North Africa, was very influenced by North African architecture, uh, then went to Italy, uh, had a room, had a rented a bathroom, so a bathtub was, was his bed. And then went to Britain at the very end, 
um, so I see er er and then Japan later. So I see Ericsson as as you know. But what is what is indigenous with with Ericsson's work is he takes the native longhouse um, that that entrance like this. I mean, just look at the Museum of Anthropology. Have you been to the Museum of Anthropology? Okay, that's, that's based on a, a native longhouse. And you'll see a lot of those elements. Um, I mean, I see some of Erickson right here, actually. Um, uh, so Erickson blends these two. Now, others of you may have another idea about his work that would be interesting to hear about. But... He's an amazing, he's a wonderful example of what we're talking about. So thanks for your question. Um, I, I see the, the, con the Canadian state as a construct which is constantly being contested, um, not only uh, in the Quebec context, in the Quebecois context, but certainly in the context of the people who were here before the, the colonial experience ever happened, you know. Um, with their own artistic traditions, the poles and so on, the carvers, etc., um, and engaged in a constant revisiting of their status within this colonial project called Canada. Um, and when you're talking about foreign influences and so on, I was thinking about the abstract expressionists, for example, um, Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, other people, Ronald Bladen. Um, had his moment as an abstract expressionist and the way in which their work was very much about universal values and the rejection of a nation nationalist framing of their work and then uh, people like Clement Greenberg writing something called American type painting trying to generate an entirely manipulative narrative about that work that effaces these um, universalist as aspirations um, and of course Barnett Newman uh, pointed specifically to the indigenous um, arts of the Northwest Coast uh, in his own search, uh, you know, uh, evaluate it how you may, um, of these universal values. So uh, how productive is, is it to frame what goes on in Canada around this elusive category of nation state? Yeah. No, good, good, good response. One thing I will, will mention, and you must know um, uh, uh, Bougeot's book on how America stole the abstract expressionist art, art from Quebec. Um, if you look at um, Quebec abstract expressionist painting beginning in the mid-1940s, uh, people like Bordois, um, it, it's quite interesting to see how they were developing their own uh, sure. work. And Bordeaux yeah. identified as an anarchist. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. an anti-nationalist politics yeah. right yeah. there. Oh, it certainly was, yes. Anti-Quebec, anti-Canada. Yeah. I've heard Jeff say that he's, uh, he doesn't consider himself a Canadian artist, but a, and that art has an international statement. I'm just wondering if you could, for those who haven't heard you say that, Jeff, if you have a bit of uh, ability to just elaborate on what you mean by that, or if you do now consider yourself a Canadian artist, or that is even a category that's relevant to you. Right. Um, I think artists are born, they have a history that we know of at least 37,000 years, 40,000 years back to the Chauvet Cave. I really don't see art as something that really belongs to any nationality. So I think right off the top that from an artist's point of view, all states are artificial. And so what artists do share is a certain genetic background that they can actually share with each other. That, as far as I could see, was what was being sought in the, in the 20th century to displace, to displace that. I felt that the Canada Council made it, and I, after coming back from the States in 1969-1970, I was aware that there were some very strong Canadian sculptors and, and painters here that were equal to anyone else in the world. So I really felt that it was a great failure on the uh, Canada Council's part in the 1960s not to bring in international artists who into this country and show the Canadians with and how competitive they were as international artists. And so 
the very fact that they were commodifying, as Europe was doing, as Americans were doing, commodifying the art in another way other than just its, its uh, market value, was commodifying it in terms of nationality. I thought that was a great error. Yeah. Uh, the Canadian artists who were here could have competed with any other artists in the world. And when I say compete, it's not that artists compete in a certain way. What you need to do, and this is one of the reasons why I showed in America in the 1980s and continue to show in America through the 90s, was that you want your work compared to what is out there. And if you try to isolate it in some nationalistic way, as the French have done, you end up with uh, uh, really terrible work. It, it ultimately, the concept of na nations commodifying the work or co-opting the work on a nationalist basis really does deal with the artificiality of the state. So the artists who share naturally this genetic background, and there's... I, I've isolated it now to, to, to three parts. The first part is, is the definition of art as an act of will in accord with the mature conscience. That's looking at conscience as being one of the most substantive fit of our genetic makeup that it allows for art. The other is the sense of the sacred. So screw religion. We're really talking about screw religion. When I look at sacred art, I know when the artists themselves have perceived the sacredness of art, and I don't care what religion that is. So not even religion has a, a hold, no matter how universal it may claim to be, over art. And then the third aspect of it, the third aspect of it, which uh, uh, I, I see expressed in it that is a, a genetic expression, is the sense of awe. And so when we look at great art, it doesn't matter what the culture is. You're going to three, that three set of judgments, that three set of judgments is what artists share with each other, what Aaron called, unfortunately he didn't come here, a tribe of his own. He's talking about what makeup this universal aspect of art shares. And it's, you know, it's been crippled ever since the caves uh, in, in the age of agriculture as artists in their ability to do analogies have been defined in terms of, uh, uh, of perpetuating the, the ruling and the warrior class, which means that naturally they're going to look like nationalist artists and other things. The breakthrough, as I've explained and, and said in, in, two, in my essay in 2010, was the Magdalene by uh, Donatello. It's totally universal. It's the fusion again of the artist with his subject, which we hadn't seen since the caves. And so when I look at the best attempts, and we, we discussed this back in 1911, the best attempts of modernism uh, uh, through the early 20th century were to break all of that down, as Gandinsky did, is to look for those three aspects, and those three aspects are probably, in my mind, the way of judging all art. And so when other artists, whenever that's adapted to whatever culture it happens to be, each one of those genetic parts that really make the sense of art at its very essential level breaks down. So instead, what we're looking at in terms of the nation state and the concept of nationalism is each one is a statement of removal of the greatness that's inherent in art itself. I wish you could have been one of the uh, founders of the county council. <laughs> you might have looked a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with all that. But un un unfortunately, uh, it, it went in a, in a different way and uh, Canada, Canadians felt they had to define themselves as, as somehow different either from Americans or British or, or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, it's sad. Soon, as soon as you it's bring sad. nationalism into it, you break down the really essence of art that I see. The act of will in accord with the mature conscience being very essential. We need, we impute nationalist commitments or motives to identifying national influences. If we I mean, I'm not an art historian, but uh, 
I've always been told there was an Italian Renaissance. I've always been told there was a Dutch school of painting in the 17th, 18th century. I've, I've been told that there were French Impressionists who came along in the 19th century. And th those are not meaningless categories, and, and they're not simply trying efforts to appropriate uh, a, 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 an often innovative uh, stylistic revolution indeed for, 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 for nationalist ends they're, they're ways of describing a certain sort of reality aren't they yeah but I think that the probably the argument that Maria was also tracing is the way that they can be Right, and so even with uh, no one, would, I, mean, I think Rembrandt, for example, I think is an interesting case. I just went to an exhibition in Berlin about Rembrandt as a German artist and how important it was to reclaim him as a German and the way that you know Dutch uh, or Italian schools, the same way that Italian Renaissance is instrumental for Mussolini's way of thinking of what it is that makes them Italian, whereas of course at the time of the Renaissance this was a bunch of city states, right? So, so I think that that's what's the, the, what, what you're tracing, right? The, yeah. the way that art reflects yeah. a story of a nation and its insecurities. Um, the, as we move into the, the question of art history in the, in the future as we're de dealing with it, Peter, I think you really have struck something that's a very important contribution. The question of categories, categorization after the fact. Uh, right, so that in, in order to write a structured history, you look at it and you say, "Okay, this is so much easier to identify it in this category, even though the category itself might be really, really questionable." Uh, th I, I think of I think of um, uh, the Prado, and I, I think that the my my uh, favorite painting by Rubens is. The spring, the the peasants in the spring. I think about. I can't remember what this. It is is, is a spring song. That's a Rubens in the Prado. Once you start breaking this down, you realize that, you know, the the thing that is as direct to that source of art that I see when the artist actually is in fusion with the subject matter, the categories will break down almost automatically. If it's a matter of. Uh, categorizing for the sake of history, then that should be understood that this is a categorical statement and really needs to be isolated as something that is a categorical statement rather than an identity statement. And I, I, I think that that's going to be part of our discussions in the future as to what the future disposition of art history is. I think we've got one question from Sergey, and then maybe we'll have one after that. And then It's a very, just a very quick comment. Of, um, when I came to United States, North America in 89, and I participated in a few panels discussing art. And what I find, uh, to my surprise, because I just came out from totalitarian state, which is a long history of suppressing art through the means of state, whether it was a communism, socialism, or nationalism. And yet, in every single panel I participated, the artists wanted more from the state here in the United States, not in Canada, in the United States. They wanted support, they wanted the special department of art, they wanted this and that. And when I tried to warn them of the dangers of getting the state involved, Somehow, uh, you know, my argument fell on a deaf ears because they really wanted to have sources of income, this and that, and they couldn't see beyond the immediate benefits that such a control would be so terrible. So in some ways, it's good to have a weak state in cultural area. Does anyone have a final comment or question? Oh, yes, one over here. Uh, listening to you all and maybe just going back a little bit about what is Canadian or how did we get to where we are. Um, I almost think sometimes, especially in, from the arts point of view, um, what is Canadian? And as we try to strive towards that and try to figure out what is, it's almost like we've missed our opportunity to be Canadian because while we were trying to be that, all of a sudden the world's become so global and uh, I don't even know if there ever will be a Canadian something. And I, and I look at it from a positive point of view. It gives 
us an awesome opportunity to be wide-eyed, and, and I, I see it in Jeff's work. I think it's, um, it's uninfluenced sometimes only by the, the artist himself, and, and, and when we look back at eras beyond, like Peter just mentioned, maybe that will never be again, the, those uh, eras where we can identify art with a certain nation or something, but um, that's just my thought about what's looking forward. No, that's, that's a very good point. Had I taken this uh, short talk further, we would have got into that territory, John. So thank you. <laughs>